My surmises were verified. There remained but one more point to clear up. I was determined to set my mind at ease on the subject, and therefore afterwards I asked D, who had retired to his own home, who it was that advised him to quit the house in which he had sought shelter. It turned out again, as I suspected, to be his officious friend who had apprised him that the gendarmerie were in quest of him. He might have said more. He might have apprised him how they happened to go there at all. I retain a vivid recollection of those unhappy circumstances, which only afforded me a fresh proof of the weakness of man. If the individual to whom they apply should read these memoirs, let him not imagine that the new character in which he is clothed has prevented me my naming him. I owed the omission to the welfare of my children. My eyes were opened by what the first consul had confided to me, and I turned a deaf ear to every harsh remark. That loud clamor which was echoed through the saloons of Paris had no other object in view than to throw a veil over the secret intercourse kept up with the cabinet. It was wholly undeserving of notice. Amongst the very indifferent characters who composed the meetings was a superior officer who was pointed out by the disclosures of blank as capable of the most nefarious attempts. He had been dismissed from his regiment for motives of which I am quite ignorant was without any fortune or employment, and actually became one of the firebrands. In the contemplated explosion, the death of the first consul was again to throw open the career of fortune to him. He loudly avowed his intention of compassing it. His sentiments became so publicly known that he was arrested and thrown into the temple. His confinement led him to turn his conduct over his mind, and it was only calculated to alarm him, and he determined to solicit for his consul's pardon. He was the rather disposed to do so, and he doubted not that the loss of his liberty was owing to the secret information given by some false associate who had become reconciled to government at his expense. This was really the case. He offered to make some disclosures. General Davu was instructed to receive them and repair to the temple where that cavalry officer made certain communications to him of the highest importance. The first consul desired he would see the prisoner again and make him an offer of 500 louis if he would undertake a mission to London, where, by spreading the report of his having effected his escape from the temple, he might acquire a knowledge of the plans projected by the English and the emigrants for an invasion of the Western Department, as well as that of the correspondence they still kept up with the coast. General Davout sent for the prisoner and had him brought to the house where he then resided at the Tuileries on the spot now occupied by the terrace in front of the Rue saint Florentin. Meanwhile, General Blank, who has been already adverted to, happened by chance to call upon Davout and was as clamorous as ever. The object of the first consul, he said, was to restore the ancient order of things. He had begun by opening the door to emigrants. He was now bringing the clergy back and would soon dispossess the holders of national property. To sum up the whole, added he, that poor cavalry officer who was carried prisoner to the temple, had just been strangled by his orders. General Davu, who was still at a loss to understand the aim of his interlocutor, fancied at one moment that all he desired was to be asked such questions as might afford him a coloring for relieving his conscience from some heavy weight. At another moment, he imagined that he was endeavoring to detach him from the service of the First Consul. Nevertheless, General Davu allowed his language its free range, listened to all the nonsense he uttered, and at last suffered an emotion of pity to escape him, which put an end to the tirade. He gave him no other reply than to see him out of the house by the common entrance, leading him through an apartment where D was in waiting at that very moment. General Blank suddenly saw before him the cavalry officer, whom he had just reported to have been strangled. He was quite beside himself at the occurrence, but recovering his composure and well aware of the motives which brought that officer to the residence of the commandant of Paris, he returned to Davout's closet with a hurried step and said to him, I perceive that everything is known since D is here. I have been deceived. I beseech thee to accompany me at once to the first consul. Davout complied with the request. 
General Blank threw himself at the feet of the head of the government, confessed everything, gave by this mode of proceeding a fixedness to his then vacillating conduct, and opened the way to the position which he was afterwards to assume. He devoted himself from that moment to the first consul, for whom he affected to feel an exclusive attachment. With respect to the cavalry officer, he had little to add to the disclosures already known. He accepted of whose proposal, repaired to London, made some stay in that capital, and did not leave it until he had succeeded in obtaining detailed and positive information concerning a project in agitation for the purpose of overthrowing the first consul. He rejoined the marshal at the camp of Ostend and disclosed to him the conspiracy which was attempted a few months afterwards to be carried into effect he remained quiet for some time but nature broke out again he returned to his former habits in consequence of which he was strictly watched the severest orders had even been issued in the event of his being seen to loiter about the first consuls Several endeavors were afterwards made to procure him employment, but age had not ripened his judgment. His usual unsteadiness followed him everywhere. He claimed in 1814 and 1815 the merit of having been the victim of the late government. The pages of history will unfold the remainder. At the period of the occurrences I have just related, the first consul had just taken up his residence at the Palace of St. Clou which he had caused to be repaired in order that he might have the advantage of stepping from his closet into a walk which was on the same level with it and also being near to Paris and the residence of Malmaison, a very important object for those who had to hold daily communications with him. Chapter 30. Towards the end of March 1802, a commission of the Council of State, consisting of Messrs. Tronchet, Portalis, the Elder Merlin of Douay, and others, under the presidency of Camiseras, a second consul was appointed to draw up the present plan of the civil code. The first consul directed that the Council of State should enter upon the discussions of so important a subject. This body generally held its sittings three times a week. They opened at 2 o'clock and closed at 4 or 5 during the present winter. However, the consul never separated before 8 o'clock at night, and the first consul never failed to attend every one of its sittings. At no time had there been held so important a course on the law of nations. The Council of State contained at this period several men of mature experience and in the prime of life. The discussion was accordingly no less profound than enlightened. It bore the stamp of deep meditation. The first consul took so lively an interest in the debate that he generally detained a few state councillors to dinner in order to resume the discussion afterwards. When he returned alone, he remained only ten minutes at table and then withdrew to his closet where he shut himself up for the evening. If he had not to go to the council of state, he proceeded to the institute to which place I have sometimes attended him. The meetings were held at the Louvre. He repaired to the sitting by the gallery of the museum, and when it was over, he would sometimes keep back one or two of the members, seat himself on a table like a schoolboy, and enter into conversation, which was often extended to a late hour of the night. If he met anyone whose intercourse was pleasing to him, the time would run on imperceptibly. The labors of drawing up the civil code were no sooner completed than his splendid work was submitted with the usual formalities to the discussion of the tribunate. This body had already known on many occasions a spirit which foreboded that it would eventually prove an obstacle to the proceedings of the administrative branch of government, though mostly composed of men of acknowledged talent. It had assumed an attitude of hostility towards the Council of State and displayed at times a resistance which was perhaps more owing to party feeling and to a rivalry of talents than to intrigue or a tendency to exaggerated ideas. This spirit was made known to the First Consul who refused to credit its existence. So unreasonable did it appear to him. He was not long in discovering that he had formed a better opinion of that body than it deserved. 
a minute and angry discussion took place. It now became hopeless to pass the code without considerable mutilations. The necessity of carrying that great measure through was deeply felt, but as it was to be apprehended that a similar opposition would be manifested by the legislative body and thus a character of discredit be stamped upon the first work of the consular legislation, the project was given up. The elections were the means of introducing men of more enlightened wisdom to the legislative body. The tribunate, which was reduced to half its numbers from the effect of a measure dictated by prudent foresight, returned of its own accord to a less hostile system. The code was again produced before that body and adopted. The first consul abolished the tribunate at a later period, and as his objection was not to the members, but to the institution itself, which was only calculated to impede his measures, he gave appointments to all its members, the greater part of whom distinguished themselves as members of the administrative branches of government, and all as men of considerable merit. I have often heard him say, with reference to some one of those with whom he had cause to be most satisfied, you see now... How it is in the tribunate, he would have opposed what he performs at present with greater alacrity than anyone else. Such is the effect of party spirit. How true it is, he added on the same occasion, that men are generally no more than grown children. Since the first consul had taken the helm of government, the laborers in every branch of the public administration had grown to a Digest extent, and yet fresh work was in progress. A water and forest department was formed, which effectually stopped the plunder of wood and substituted a wise and rational system of felling trees. Lyceums were established. The means of gratuitous instruction increased in a twofold ratio and were completed at a later period by the formation of a body of teachers. Stockbrokers became authorized agents. The lottery was remodeled and had the effect of destroying a multitude of small lotterings and private banks, quite as ruinous to the public and wholly unproductive to the state. And lastly, the excise laws were instituted. Mr. Chaptal, the Minister of the Interior, protected and encouraged all manufacturers and objects of industry with real zeal and obtained general approbation. With him originated the idea of establishing museums in each department and afterwards in Paris for the purpose of exhibiting at stated periods the produce of national industry. This happy idea was immediately carried into effect. The exhibitions were open and proved what unexpected strides the arts had made during an epoch which was deemed productive of nothing but a series of calamities. Mr. Chaptel conferred on this occasion a signal service upon France. He opened the eyes of a vast number of skeptics who had hitherto insisted upon the superiority of foreign manufacturers over our own. The comparison now instituted had the effect of removing their doubts. They were forced to admit that some of the articles which they purchased as being of English manufacture came from our own workshops and were made by the artisans whose capacity to the task they had disbelieved. It was by such simple means that he put a stop to the petty frauds of some manufacturers who were not ashamed to fix upon their goods a foreign mark in order to procure their readier sale. The agricultural interest was not less indebted to him. He was the founder of the prizes, which are still decreed at the present day in the several departments for the best agricultural produce. By the aid of time and of similar institutions, a country cannot fail to undergo considerable improvements and to attain the height of prosperity. It may be said of Mr. Chaptal that all the acts of his administration were not less marked by an enlightened patriotism than those of his private life by uprightness of character. The first consul seldom passed a week without visiting some establishments. Administrative order, general embellishments and improvements were objects upon which his mind was constantly bent. His attention was also directed to tracing canals, opening new roads, or repairing the old ones which had been wholly neglected during the revolution. The head of the state had given the impulse and animated the whole of the republic to follow his example. Repairs, labels, and reconstructions were going on in every direction, not unlike the attempts made after a storm to set afloat a ship which an unskillful pilot had suffered to run aground at Lyon, the Place Belcourt, 
was about to be restored in Paris. The works of clearing the Louvre, of removing the obstructions from the carousel, and of repairing the public monuments were rapidly proceeding. The churches which had escaped destruction were restored to religion. Those which a senseless fury had leveled with the ground were on the point of being rebuilt. The works in harbors or on the canals, in short, constructions of every kind were simultaneously going forward. It was unaccountable to all how the first consul could meet the expenses which such undertakings entailed. All were astonished. All cried wonder. It was, however... No such extraordinary wonder. Order and poverty were the cornerstone of all this superstructure. I will explain my meaning. Previously to the 18th Brumaire, the receivers general kept back the public revenue under pretext that the sums they had to collect came in very slowly, being thus deprived of any certain returns and unable to ascertain the exact state of his different public chests. The finance minister was obliged to carry on the service by means of checks drawn at a more or less remote date upon the receiver's general. These clerks were in public circulation. But as no greater dependence was placed on the solvency than on the good faith of the government, the confidence which it was attempted to infuse into public opinion was daily affected by the checks in circulation. The receiver's general took advantage of this deplorable state of things. They acted the part of bankers. Brought, bought up the checks which they were bound to discharge and thus realized enormous profits. This scandalous traffic ceased with the extinction of the government which tolerated its existence. Monsieur Godin put an immediate stop to it when he assumed the management of the finances. Everyone saw a spell in the rise of the public funds. The only spell was honesty and the return of order. The taxes were collected with rigid economy. No funds were any longer misapplied. No government securities fell in value. Public credit and public confidence had completely revived. This year was rendered remarkable by another undertaking which exclusively contemplated the interests of the metropolitan metropolis and of trade it had long been intended to dig a canal for the purpose of receiving the waters of the river Lurk and introducing them into Paris. But the labor requisite for this object was immense, and the difficulty in the way of accomplishing the work had discouraged the attempt. Some trials had, however, been made from the plant of Monsieur Girard, of which the first consul had had occasion, in Egypt to estimate the value. But so great was the obstacle raised that every idea of it was abandoned until the moment when the head of the government happened by chance to go out hunting in the forest of Bondi. The hounds led him amidst the works of the canal, which partly encroached upon the forest. He immediately left the chase and ordered us to follow him. He examined in person the works that were already completed, and as he had long before this time visited the work, which extends along the river Lurk and that of the projected canal, as far as it extended, the obstacles which had caused their being suspended now recurred to his mind. He gave up all thoughts of resuming the chase, returned at once to Paris, and issued orders for assembling at the Tuileries that very night. All the superintendents of highway who were for and against the plan, he brought them together, closely attended the discussion, found the objections untenable, the replies to the most satisfactory, and immediately ordered the resumption of the works, which were continued with great activity, but of which it was not reserved for him to witness the completion he so anxiously looked for. Chapter 31. The state of peace we enjoyed had gradually removed the public mistrust. The first consul had erased from the list of emigrants the names of all those who solicited that favor. He had even restored to them such part of their property as had not been sold and was still under national sequestration. His ready compliance tended to increase the applications, and he was obliged to adopt the general course in order to put a stop to the claims which constantly poured in upon him. His first intention was to cause the repeal of the law respecting emigration, but it was represented to him that such a measure would be attended with worse consequences than the evil to which he was desirous of applying a remedy. An early decree of the council. 
of state accepted from the list of emigrants the clergy who had been transported beyond seas, children under 16 years of age. Laborers, artisans, ETC, a Senatus Consultum of 1802 granted them a full amnesty. The first consul afterwards caused a list to be drawn up of the persons whose actions or birth had brought them into a state of hostility against the new system of laws and expunged in the mass all other names. The suppression of the Ministry of Police became a necessary consequence of this measure. There was no longer any occasion for exercising a rigid watchfulness when nothing was left to be guarded against. This opportunity was taken for pointing out to the First Consul that such an authority could not now be kept up without seriously endangering the popularity and consideration with which he was endeavoring to invest his power. By continuing to tolerate that authority, he was affording pretexts for calumny and raising suspicions as to the intentions of government. The first consul pretended to be convinced by these arguments and did not perhaps regret attempting that no one had ventured before him the maintenance of order by means of the gendarmerie and of the public tribunals. Mr. Fouché was furious against Monsieur de Talleyrand, whom he looked upon as the author of a measure which removed him from the council and at the same time deprived him of an office which he considered as an irremovable appanage. He accordingly resorted to reprisals, threw out doubts of the sincerity and political intentions of the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and endeavored by every possible channel to convey those suspicions to the knowledge of the First Consul, who unfortunately for himself and for Monsieur de Talleyrand attached more importance to them than they deserved. Nevertheless, the Ministry of Police was suppressed, and Monsieur Fouché was appointed a member of the Conservative Senate. Monsieur Ebriel who held the seals of the Ministry of Justice, received a similar appointment. The First Consul united both ministries into one under the name of Ministry of the Chief Judge, which he confided to Monsieur Renier, then a counselor of state. He gave him four assistant, Monsieur Real, to whom he entrusted the management of everything that was connected with the public safety or that required proceedings, which would have been inadequately carried on by a solicitor general. Matters went on tolerably well at first. All were tired of war and discord. All were anxious for repose and desirous of repairing the losses they had sustained. No one dreamed of disturbing a state of prosperity which was solely to be ascribed to the late concentration of power. The Swiss were still ruled by the government which the French Directory had imposed upon them, but the exasperated feelings excited against a power exclusively resting upon a foreign invasion had reached the highest pitch. They ran to arms in every quarter. A general scene of confusion ensued, and the storm which had settled with us into a calm was raging with violence over Switzerland. The contending parties were not long in coming to blows. The party opposed to the directory was so numerous that it overpowered the other. In the very onset of the contest, the defeated party immediately availed itself of a treaty which included France. It claimed the first consul's assistance. He was placed in a position of great difficulty. He would neither allow a civil war to be kindled, nor the Helvetic independence to be crushed. He had, however, instructed General Ney to enter Switzerland with a corps of troops and caused Redding, the instigator of the disturbances, to be arrested. And he dispatched Rapp, his aide-de-camp in all haste, who providentially arrived at the moment when the parties were coming to blows. Rapp, with a rare presence of mind, alighted from his carriage, placed himself between the two armies, loudly declaring in the German language that he was authorized to denounce as an enemy of the French nation whichever of the two parties should commence firing, and that he was ordered to introduce a fresh body of French troops into the Swiss territory. His firmness produced the greater effect, as both parties had the same consequences to apprehend from a second invasion. They became reconciled, agreed to assemble the cantons, and to leave to the first consul the mediation of their misunderstandings. The latter accepted the part of mediator, received in a friendly manner the deputation sent to lay before him the wishes and wants of a nation which had been driven to arms by the worthlessness of the directory, and appointed a commission of senators, Monsieur Fouché among the rest, to discuss 
with the deputies. The groundwork of the Constitution was suitable to the mountain people of whom they were the chosen representatives. The Constitutional Act was soon agreed upon. The deputies, pleased with the result of their mission, requested the First Consul to retain the title of mediator which had been conferred upon him, the country was restored to its wonted tranquility without the least effusion of blood, and thus celebrated Monsieur de la Arp, who had governed it under the title of director, came to fix his residence in Paris. The winter which followed, the conclusion of peace was rendered remarkable by the great influx of distinguished foreigners. They came to France from all quarters. Our civil discords had, however, been represented to them in such a light that they had pictured to their minds the capitals half destroyed. They were greatly surprised at not discovering any trace of such devastation, and at hearing it said in every direction that the city exhibited a finer appearance than it did before the troubles which had been represented to them in such gloomy colors. The formalities of etiquette had not yet been established. Madame Bonaparte did not give any public receptions. She feared to involve herself in unpleasant scenes by the pretensions that might be started by some foreign ladies in a palace into which etiquette had not as yet found its way, or to offend their pride by the claims which she felt conscious were due to her rank, Accordingly, nothing could be more dull at that time than the palace of the Tuileries. The first consul never left his closet. Madame Bonaparte, in order to while away the time, was under the necessity of going every night to the theater with her daughter, who never left her sight. When the representation was over, of which, however, she seldom waited to see the conclusion, she returned to finish the evening by a game of whist, or if the party was not sufficiently numerous, by a game of piquette which she played with the second consul or some other state personage. The ladies of the first consul's aide de camp, who were the same age as Madame Louis Bonaparte, came to keep her company. Every day brought with it the same round of visitors and the same amusements. The week ran on at Malmaison the same way as it did in Paris. The second consul gave public receptions to the functionaries of government and the members of the magistracy. His ma residence was the only one in which anything of a parade of state was to be seen. Foreigners, on the other hand, filled the state apartments, of which Mr. de Talleyrand did all the honors. It was in the course of this winter that the first consul caused Monsieur T to be arrested and confined in the temple. On his return from England by way of Holland, this arrest was represented as an act of tyranny. The following, however, were the real grounds for it. Monsieur T, who had formerly been a member of the Parliament of Paris, had been leading a very restless life after since he had quitted France. He had successfully residenced in England and in Germany and at last taken shelter in America. His unquiet spirit had crossed the seas with him, but he was a slave to his opinions. He preferred enduring every privation to the sacrifice of them. Such was his distressing condition when he learned the events that followed upon General Bonaparte's return, tired of roaming about the world and anxious to see his children, he determined upon returning to Europe. He met some Dutchmen of Suriname on board the ship in which he had taken his passage, formed an acquaintance with them, and ascertained that the colony, unwilling to continue to belong to a government which could not afford it protection, was sending to treat with the British ministry, or in other words, to invite them to take possession of the settlement. They were perfect strangers in London and nevertheless felt desirous that their mission should not be known in Holland, from which they were now at so short a distance and with which they kept up an intercourse. Mr. T removed all their difficulties. He had still retained some old connections in England. He opened a correspondence with the government and succeeded in quietly procuring for the Dutch the protection which they had come to solicit. The ministry who obtained possession of Suriname by this intrigue acted generously toward the manager of it so that Mr. T saw before him the double prospect of returning to France and of repairing his fallen fortunes. The negotiation which he had carried on over opened a kind of intercourse between him and the British ministry. Mr. Pitt consulted him as to the degree of confidence, which was due to a French ambassador who had just addressed a paper to him respecting the means best calculated for curtailing the power of the first consul. Mr. T, 
who had known that personage previously to his emigration, imagined from such an overture that he had remained true to his original principles and gave the minister a flattering account of him. Pitt entrusted him with the paper, and T, on running it over, discovered it in his own opinions and felt persuaded that he might rely on his old friend. He hastened to his place of residence, paid him a visit, related his good and bad fortune, and solicited his assistance. The other made him very fine promises, but threw out some expressions in the course of conversation which indicated political principles of a complexion widely far and from those which his friend had anticipated. How canst thou tell all this to me was T's exclamation. I know thy real thoughts. Having read thy memorial, Pitt himself confided it to me. The diplomatist denied the fact and yet redoubled his caresses and offers of service. The emigrant trusted to those protestations and took his departure for Paris, but he had been pointed out to the police as an English spy sent with large sums of money. His obliging friend had taken care to make known the part he had acted in the Suriname intrigue. The first consul could not avoid ordering his arrest. Anxiety of mind and that state of irritation which treachery never fails to create soon brought T to the grave. He died in the bitterness of heart of a man perishing the victim of the designs of a false friend. Chapter 32. Towards the end of March 1802, some formality of etiquette was established, and the wife of the head of the state was thenceforward attended by ladies and by officers of the household who had the charge of superintending all matters of ceremony. The ladies did not at first exceed the number of four. They were Madame de Remusa, de Talouette, de Lusset, Madame de Loriston, for whom the first consul entertained a particular regard. The four officers of the consular household were Messieurs de Cremel, de Lusset, de Delot, and de Rumouza. This court had only been installed a few months when the foreigners were introduced for the first time. The reception took place in Madame Bonaparte's apartments on the ground floor looking upon the garden. It was numerously attended and consisted of the most elegant women from the neighboring country who exhibited a rich display of jewels of which our rising court had not yet any idea. The whole diplomatic body were also in attendance. So great and short was the concourse of visitors at these ceremonious receptions that the two salons on the ground floor were hardly sufficient to contain them. When everything was ready and the places were all taken, Madame Bonaparte entered, preceded by the Minister of Foreign Relations, who introduced the foreign ambassadors. She then went round the first saloon, the minister still preceding her and naming each of the personages that lead on the way, just as she had completed the round of the second saloon. The door suddenly flew open, and in walked the first consul who appeared for the first time in the midst of this brilliant assembly. The ambassadors were already known to him, but the ladies beheld him for the first time. They all rose spontaneously and exhibited the most marked indications of curiosity. He made the rounds of the apartment, followed by the ambassadors of several powers, who named to him in succession the ladies of their respective countries. One of these receptions was the occasion on which he afterwards vented his displeasure at the conduct of England. He had just been reading the dispatches of his ambassador at the court of London, who sent him a copy of the king's message to Parliament respecting alleged armaments in the ports of France, his mind being wholly biased by the reflections to which the perusal of the dispatches had given rise. He omitted going that day into the second saloon, but went straight up to the ambassadors. I was only at the distance of a few paces from him when stopping short before the English ambassador, he put the following hurried questions to him in a tone of anger. What does your cabinet mean? What is the motive for raising those rumors of armaments in our harbors? How is it possible to impose in this manner upon the credulity of nations or to be so ignorant of our real intentions? If the actual state of things be known, it must be evident to all that there are only two transports fitting out for St. Domingo, that this island engrosses all our attention, all of our disposable means. Why then those complaints? Can peace be already considered? Be considered as a burden to be shaken off? Is Europe to be again deluged with blood? Preparations making for war to pretend to overawe us? 
France may be conquered, perhaps even crushed, but never intimidated. The ambassador made a respectful bow and gave no reply. The first consul left that part of the saloon, but whether he had been a little heated by this explosion of ill humor or from some other cause, he ceased his round and withdrew to his own apartments. Madame Bonaparte followed. In an instant, the saloons were cleared of company. The ambassadors of Russia and England had retired to the embrasure of a window and were still found conversing together after the apartment had been cleared of visitors. Indeed, said one to the other, you could hardly expect such an attack. How then could you be prepared to reply to it? All you have to do is give an account of it to your government. In the meantime, let what has taken place suggest to you the conduct you ought to pursue. He took the advice. The communications became cold and reserved. England had already formed her determination. A spirit of acrimony soon sprung up between the two governments. An interchange of notes took place. Categorical explanations were demanded. The demand for passports soon followed. The latter were immediately granted by the first consul. I was in his closet at St. Cloud when Monsieur Murray was introduced, who brought with him the correct draft of the reply, which was to accompany the passports. He had it read out to him and expressed himself in the kindest terms respecting the personal character of Lord Whitworth, for whom he felt great regard. He was quite satisfied that on this occasion the ambassador had not at all influenced the conduct of his government. Some points had remained in dispute ever since the Treaty of Amiens. Malta, according to its stipulation, was to have been restored to the Order of St. John of Jerusalem. England refused her consent because of the possession of that island secured her dominion over the Mediterranean. France likewise expected that England would, in conformity with her engagements, evacuate Egypt and the Cape of Good Hope. France, on her part, had faithfully fulfilled her own engagements. It was absurd to urge our naval armaments as a reason for declaring war against us, since those were notoriously inadequate to afford to the colony of St. Domingo the assistance it stood in need of. The genius of the First Consul and the state of prosperity to which he had raised France were the real grounds of England's alarm. That country had formed a correct estimate of his importance and had therefore vowed a war of extermination against him. The fixed determination to renew it at the first favorable moment was evident from the circumstance of these armaments, affording the only pretense for doing so. I would, I think, have been much more consonant with truth to have avowed that the real ground of the war was, on the contrary, the absolutely disarmed condition of France, a condition, therefore, which presented some prospect of success against her, and that the favorable moment which was looked for when the peace was submitted to had now arrived. I have become more and more confirmed in this opinion when at a later period I acted a part in public affairs and when my official situation enabled me on a variety of occasions to attend to preceding occurrences. Since the Battle of Zurich, won by Messina over the Russians, this nation seemed no longer to take any active part in the events of the war in Germany and Italy and the relations established between the Emperor Paul and the First Consul having brought on a peace between their respective countries, the Russians disappeared from the fields of battle. Prussia, ever since the Treaty of Basel, had maintained the strictest neutrality. Austria stood alone in the struggle. England had indeed promised her the assistance of a civil war in France, but the First Consul had triumphed over the efforts she made to foment it. He had led into Italy all the Republican troops which the pacification of the Western departments rendered available to him. The Emperor was no longer in a condition to continue the contest, and if the Army of the Rhine, after its victory at Hohenlinden had been commanded by a more skillful general. Vienna would have fallen into our hands. Austria had accordingly hastened to avert the storm and had consented to a peace because it could not prolong the war without putting its existence to hazard. Of all the enemies of France, England, therefore, alone possessed all her physical and moral strength unimpaired. This condition was to be ascribed to circumstances which it may not be superfluous to dwell upon. All the continual states mainly rely upon their agricultural condition for the resources. They can only flourish when that condition is prosperous. 
England rests upon a quite different basis. She depends upon her commercial power and the resources with which commerce supplies her can alone support her power as a state and extension and development of the one power must therefore necessarily give greater rage and augmentation to the other. Whatever tends to desolate the rest of Europe, whatever crushes industry and throws impediments in the way of trade, such as a state of war or a system of prohibitions, are the grounds of England's prosperity. She disowns the rights of neutral flags, seizes and carries off the vessels that put out to sea, and by dint of violence, compels the continual nations to draw their supplies from herself. Having thus acquired the monopoly of purchasing, manufacturing, and selling, she commands any price, and is in possession of every market. In a state of war, which is the ruin of other nations, is a state of prosperity to her. She has accordingly never missed an opportunity of forcing Europe into the field of battle.